Hi, welcome to Black Women's Hour. Uh, normally it's with Ava Vidal and me, but today it's just the trusty sidekick left to her own devices. What will we get up to? Um, I'm really excited today actually to welcome our fantastic guest, Daisy. Um, we're really lucky to have her. She's talking about something that's a difficult subject, but really, really, really worthwhile. So we are grateful to you, Daisy, for everything you've done, but also for talking to us. Um, she is the woman who you may have seen in the news who helped get justice against her birth father, um, who raped her mother. So I'm hoping you can understand. Um, so we don't have her on video, but we do have her wonderful voice. So uh, hi, Daisy. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. I wonder whether you could um, give us a little summary of your story. I will try and do this as briefly as I can, spanning about a decade really, but um, see, I was born in 1975. I was conceived as the result of the rape of my 13 year old birth mother who was raped by a family friend um, who was aged 29 at the time. Um, I was placed into care at seven days old and placed for adoption at seven months old. Um, I grew up in a transracial family, so I had white adoptive parents, white siblings, lived in a white town, in a white area, um, went to school with nobody that reflected my ethnicity or culture at all until sort of 13. Anyway, I did seek to reunite with my birth mother in order to do that, I sought my social care files. And in my social care files, it's then when I read that I was conceived as a result of rape when my birth mother went to babysit. That was horrific, although I'd already had a bit of information sort of explaining the age, well, not explaining the age difference, but stating birth mother 14, birth father between 30 and 35. But when I knew that information, I was around 13, 14 and didn't really seek much in, look into that very much. I was much more focused on, you know, who are these people, but particularly my birth mother. So when I did get that information, it was shocking, but not a complete surprise. And one of the biggest shocks to me is that it's written throughout my files that police and social services knew, but the matter was never brought to court. And I just thought, how can a child be raped, made pregnant, disclose that rape, and no one's done anything. Why do you think nobody did anything? I firmly believe there was racism. Mm -hmm. This is mid seventies, Birmingham, black working class family. Um, we know police don't take children, young people seriously now in terms of child sexual exploitation. Yeah. Um, and so you can only imagine what it would have been like back then. In fact, in court, my birth father said when he was spoken to by the police, they laughed. Um, and that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me at all. I absolutely think they just felt that my birth mother was a young, promiscuous black girl and they didn't want anything to do with it. That's what I firmly believe. And so how old are you, sorry, when, you've, when you discovered this? When you were I looking was, through your files? I was 18 when I wow, read that it's actually so right. Yeah, yeah. And where did you go with that information when you found it out? Like, who do you speak to about that? Literally the social worker sat with me, told me that information. I can't remember anybody really talking to me at depth about what that meant for me emotionally in terms of searching. It was very much like I was sort of left alone really to sort of figure out what that was for me. Um, I think the biggest impact for me was that it just felt like my birth mother wouldn't want to meet me. I would have understood that, but I just felt she may not want to meet me. This must be the worst thing that's happened for her. And before I received a photo of her, of course, I was worried that I would look like him. So if I did turn up to see her, that I would be of turning course. up, traumatizing her because mm -hmm. I had the face of her rapist. Um, so it was, yeah, different levels of sort of complexity there about the search, about my identity, about him, what that meant for me, but that absolute disgust that nothing was done to protect her. 
and also you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I always think if my, say my grandmother had decided for me to stay in that family, I would have been at risk from him. He was in that community, you know, I would have been at risk. He has been a risk to children for decades. Mm. And I mean, there is always the question, isn't there, when we find these things out. And I mean, I know from people that work in, and you will know from your line of work that these people, it's never the first time. That's right. Time, is it? That's right. And sex offence is generally the highest rate of reoffending. Yeah. Because the, those pathways are set, aren't they? Yeah. If you can rape your friend's daughter in your home with four other children in that home at the time, be spoken to by police and social care and nothing's happened. Well, really? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to stop? And that's, you know, he could have been abusing children before then. We don't know. I don't know that anyone's come forward. I hope people do feel comfortable to come forward, whether it's around my birth father, Carvel Bennett, or any other perpetrators. Um, but yeah, it's just horrendous, horrendous. And um, in terms of protection for your birth mother, I assume just nothing was done. And I mean, I know we know within all communities actually, and I'm not just gonna say the Afro-Caribbean community, but that's just one that I'm familiar with, but I know yeah. from speaking to elders in my community that sexual abuse it was covered up, was normalized, totally. was, you know, I mean, there are horror stories actually really of, you know, particularly step parents having, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, first kind of dipped. I can't even like, to use any of the terminology. Um, but yeah, and it, no, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it, when you're talking about marginalized communities, because you mm. know that anytime you do go to the police, whatever happens is either going to be amplified or made worse or ignored. So there's yes. people, it, you, it, it, you can see why people didn't, but at the same time, it, it means there's no protection whatsoever yes. for the most vulnerable people. Absolutely. And it's that, that um, theory of cultural betrayal. Yes, you're going exactly. out, you know, and there's a sense of, for me still, I know I've done the right thing, but actually, you know, that community in Birmingham, what are they thinking of me? I, I don't live there. I'm not attached to it. But um, yeah, it's really complex. Like you say, it's all communities this happens in and this permissiveness, mm. like generational permissiveness, just a little sex um yeah you can just imagine the atmosphere at the time but she received no help no support and how long have you been fighting this case for well it was in around 2011 2012 more historic high profile cases were in the news so Jimmy Savile Rolf mm -hmm. Harris um and I'd always thought on DNA evidence I think I'd written to my birth mother in my 20s saying, you know, I'm DNA evidence if you thought about prosecution and it was a no-go at that stage. Um, but with these historical abuse cases, with what I felt was less evidence than I had, um, it felt like it was being taken successful, these were being successful cases to prosecute. And I just thought, well, I've got the corroborating evidence from social care files and I am DNA evidence. It wasn't like a grey area. She was 16, 17, 18. Yeah. She was a 13 year old little girl. Um, so I felt naively, it seems now, that um, this was, that everything was right to go forward with it. So I did about two years of research. That was research around sexual offences, that was search around evidence-based prosecutions, which are normally used just mainly in domestic abuse cases. That's where there's enough kind of mm. GP, hospital, police reports to make a case because of the nature of reporting is so difficult. Um, I also did a bit more tracing, got my files back, which that allowed me to identify my birth father. It was a lot of sleuthing. I had an mm. incorrect, incorrect name, incorrect address, but managed to, yeah, managed to... For him, to for your birth father? Yeah, yeah. How come? Surely they, your, your birth mother's family knew exactly who he was, no? Um, the files just said a name. I think his name was Everton Bennett. Mm. His name is obviously, we know, Carvel Bennett. So again... Was that just the West Indian thing, where you know how we can't call 
ourselves by the right name in any way. I know. I don't know if it is just that or he mm. had purposely used a different name. Yes. I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, Hello? I still got you. So Daisy, how did you go about finding your birth father to actually bring the prosecution? Well, initially I've done a couple of years of research on sex offences, um, did some research on my own family, um, looked through the files I had already. Uh, 2014 was the first time I approached Birmingham City Council and West Midlands Police. I'd informed my mother, birth mother really clearly that I was wanted to do this as an evidence-based prosecution or for me to be seen as the victim. I felt really strongly that you know she had already done what she needed to do as a child and had been mm. let down. No one had listened. So what you know, what else should she have to do? Um, and thought it's the responsibility of those agencies now to do what they should have done sort of, well, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, contacted social care and the Safeguarding Children's Board. They, their responses were pitiful, really. Initially contacted the police. They went out to visit my birth mother. That was not my intention. That was their process. I went to them saying a victimless evidence-based prosecution. I was told, mm. oh, we don't really do those. Okay. Um, mm. And then reported back saying, yeah, your birth mother doesn't want to make a statement. I said, yes, I know. But that doesn't stop me from wanting to do one. This right. is a safeguarding issue. He's a risk mm -hmm. to children. Anyway, didn't get any further with them requested five more, more files, was able through getting my files back again to establish his name and address. So got his identity, went back to the police. I found him, still didn't want to know, still kept saying you're not the victim. Your birth mother doesn't want to press charges. So sort of go on your way really. But I kept going back to them. I know I had a work appointment in Birmingham one week and said, listen, I'll come take my DNA. Cause I guess for me, all the evidence was there and children were still at risk, yeah. still at risk. Um, and as the years have progressed, Birmingham Council were under special measures. So again, thought I'd be taken more seriously. No, um, there's always been concerns about West Midlands Police and their um, investigation of child sexual exploitation, child abuse and sexual offences generally. Um, that had been cited in an inspection report around 2014, 2015. So I just thought, yeah, it was initially really naive because I thought the environment is right. People are caring, you know, this council's under special measures, but no, I was deemed vexatious by the police. Wow. Yeah, that was a stinging letter. Wow. So got what, to the point. What do you think, I mean, without, well, not to put too fine a point on it, I don't understand how somebody in your situation who's conceived a, by the rape of a child, you know, and wants some kind of justice when the, your birth mother hasn't been protected or supported, you haven't been protected or supported. Mm -hmm. How are you vexatious for wanting some kind of recourse? Yeah. They said to me, if you've got a complaint about what we're doing or not doing, there's a complaints procedure. Follow the complaints procedure got a letter back deeming my complaint vexatious. I appealed that through, it was then the IPCC, that got turned around within minutes. They you mean the police the letter. investigating the police? Yeah. But that really, mm. really useful yeah. panel All of us often finds the police at fault always, right? Yeah, yeah. Like right them, yeah. okay, good. Not biased at all. No so, yeah, bias got, whatsoever. That was kind of turned around within hours they received it. Yeah, upheld, you're vexatious. And I have to say, I can, depending on my mood, I can laugh about it now. I kind of think, you know, I'll take that as a bit of a, you know, I'll take that as a bonus. I'll take that as a positive. But at the time I got sent that letter, mm. it was absolutely crushing because I have been picking up the foot. I put hundreds, thousands of hours in on top of my day job, which is a social worker, um, 
contacting solicitors being told repeatedly, sorry, you're not the victim, childcare professionals, experts, MPs, I've either got ignored completely or told I'm not the victim. Did it change any law? Because you think, I mean, this sounds like a precedent case to me. If, yeah. Right? I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. I've, I've got the support of Centre for Women's Justice because my campaign is about um, the legal definition of victim to include children conceived in rape. Wow, um, that's huge. And or that there is a greater use of evidence based prosecutions with cases like this. These perpetrators cannot keep we just got to do something. I feel like I've heard so many platitudes over the last especially last decade around child sexual abuse. It's an mm. epidemic. We mm. hear about the horrific, horrifically low figures on charging for rape, let alone prosecutions. So part of my naivety was thinking, this is good PR for these two agencies, for the mm. police and social care. If anything, just do it because it's good PR, let alone a sh one of the worst crimes you could commit, and this person is free to commit further crimes against children in Birmingham. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll be um, releasing a crowd justice fund in the next couple of weeks with Centre for Women's Justice to look at changing that legislation. I can't when did it start to feel like it was, sorry to interrupt, did it feel like it was starting to change? Because obviously you've got the letter, or, you know, um, informing you of the IPCC's decision. Yeah. And then, so that must have felt like, you know, you, you, you know, hit a brick wall. In, yeah. You know, after all the hours and like you said, hours, thousands of hours you'd spent campaigning, complaining, um, gathering evidence, researching. Yeah, so it got to a point I connected with a journalist who wrote for the Birmingham Mail called Jeanette mm. Oldham, and together we basically wrote and she edited an article, and that was released in Birmingham Mail, Mar end of March 2017, because I thought there's nowhere to go. Um, I'll do it under a pseudonym. This is... This is ridiculous. And, you know, a couple of people along the way have said, oh, you keep going with that, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. And I'll be telling you when I'm going to stop and I'm not going to stop yet. I think that injustice is so unpalatable. I could never have let it go. So eventually got this article released, um, published in the Birmingham Mail, thinking, great, this will hopefully get public reaction, police, social care, MPs, people who want to do good. Mm. nothing no response no reaction at all um and then you know I'm working on writing a memoir about adoption and this sort of fight for justice so I started sort of doing some writing and then I sent I decided to send the article into the Victoria Derbyshire show um in December 2018 and they featured my story it's like a 20 minute segment that was mm. finally came out in August the 5th 2019 that was featured and that was definitely the catalyst for things to change and then you um, feel like you started being taken seriously just from that publicity yeah mm. I think after the show my birth mother started deciding about making a statement in her own right um but also so the show was 5th of August on a Monday and the police turned up on my mother's doorstep on the Saturday. The police who had laughed originally and called you vexatious. Those Called me vexatious. Wow. Told me to stop complaining. Didn't contact me, but turned up on her doorstep. Well, you weren't the victim after all. No, no. Um, um, and then things progressed from there. She did, you know, I'm incredibly proud and I think it's incredibly courageous that she did eventually make a statement. All right. Um, I eventually was asked to do a statement. So I did say to them, isn't, it's interesting, isn't it? The person you deemed vexatious is now making a witness statement and providing DNA, irrefutable mm. evidence, right? You had offered to provide before. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you several years. Again. Um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely was willing to give that DNA years ago. Yeah. Um, so after that the father was eventually arrested in December I wasn't told about that the journalist I worked with in Victoria Derbyshire told me no one informed me um he was originally arrested in December DNA was taken then and he was re-arrested in 2020 
January, um, the DNA obviously confirmed I'd got the right person. What I was really annoyed about um, is that the police officer phoned me and said, I've spoken to your birth mother. We thought it's morally right that you know the results. How's that even legal? That's my voluntary DNA and you've not spoken to me first. Really, yeah. really strange. It should have been your, you gave it. That... Yeah. And again, it's everything so unprecedented. They don't, they there don't is know. no, there is yeah. no precedence. There's no common case sense. to refer to. There's no yeah. process would, or procedure. Totally. I would say mm. that's an issue of data protection and basic common sense and decency. You would have thought, wouldn't you? It'd be at least yeah. data protection. Forget. I mean, we can't assume anyone's level of common sense, decency, can we? Now? Absolutely not. Um, people's, uh, some people have none whatsoever, but certainly GDPR and data protection, that kind of thing would be huge, yeah. right? Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, how do you think, and obviously this is a difficult question, obviously, you know, please feel free not to answer it. How do you think it's affected your life? Because obviously, as, an, a, as somebody who has adopted a transracially, which I'd love to, you know, you to talk about, then to find out later on that there's just another thing that potentially mm. makes you feel a little bit othered and a little bit outside yourself. I, well, how do you think that's affected your life if you're willing to talk about it? Absolutely. And I think you've hit the mark with being othered. Mm. I, mean, I was encapsulated myself to someone the other day as I, I'm a black, rape conceived, transracially adopted woman. There's a lot of marginalisation there. Yeah. Um, adoption, if we just take adoption for starters, people still don't fully understand the trauma of adoption, of adoption separation, the psychology of adoption adoptees are four times more likely to commit suicide oh, that's a horrific statistic um that just says it all to me of course that says it all so to much me. in that statistic when, you can't you know there's so much isn't there yeah mm. and I don't think that's made clear to people why that is but the separation and trauma of that separation if like me so you've been with your birth mother my you know, think about my conception, her pregnancy as a 13 year old. She turned 14 two days before my birth. Yeah. She concealed the pregnancy. Um, so her pregnancy, my pre birth health would have been compromised. Her health was compromised. And even cortisol levels, cortisol passes yeah. through the, the um, about, doesn't it? Through the, so that it, it is in utero with your baby. Totally. Mm. So I guess one way of saying it is people like me who've had that experience pre-birth, we don't have a non-traumatised version of ourselves because that trauma started before. Um, so all of that as a foundation, you get moved from hospital. In hospital, I was alone for three days. I initially read that I was in hospital for 10 days with my birth mother, got the other files back. It was very clear it was seven days. That was so upsetting on top of all the other stuff, just thinking, this baby left, the damage that was done in those three days of being left by your birth mother. Um, I was with fantastic foster carers who I'm still in touch with, lost touch, but kind of reunited a few years ago with, with them for seven months and then moved to adoption at seven months old. So already that's a lot. That's a lot of changes. Consistency. I say to people, I've had three mothers, but yet I feel motherless. 45 years of age I don't have someone who is a mother figure to me I would say and how was how was being adopted for you what was your adoption experience like really difficult I was very aware of being different I was in a white family white environment bless them but at the time I was adopted very little to no knowledge about adoption trauma or the impact of or the, the absolute need to try and meet your child's ethnicity, cultural needs. Um, and what was that like in, in terms of just, I mean, like, like we were saying, like just, just being a black person in a room full of white people, you feel like if that's your family, and there's also, I mean, I'm sure you know so much about this, but I always imagine that there must be a, a level of feeling guilty that you should be glad to be there. You should be grateful. I think yeah. adoptees, let's think the grateful adopter, you should be grateful. I can appreciate being brought up in a very nice middle class family with a lot of privilege. However, mm. what that's done in terms of my sense of self, my mental health, you factor in rape, finding out rape conception at 18, mm. what that does to you, um, what that can say about yourself. And I think that's 
I'm interested in terms of the gender difference of that for men who've been raped conceived. Um, That's well. a really interesting point. Um, if anybody would like to share their story, we would love to hear from you. And we'd happily have you both as guests together if you'd be up for that. Um, oh, that I think that would yeah. be a really interesting show. So if anyone does have you know, a story they'd like to share, get in touch. But sorry, please continue, Dave. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, you're like you were saying, you're surrounded by white people in your family. Mm. My people are as a minority in my own family, in my own village, in my own town, pretty much. For And how was it when you met other black people? Thank goodness. At 17, <laughs> Thank Jesus. At 17. Oh, my God. So there was a mixed race, like Caribbean white boy that joined our secondary school. I love him already. <laughs> he was the love of my life. I'm not going to say his <laughs> name, but I just thought, oh, thank God as well. Thank God. But mm. again, someone who was in foster care. Um, there was a mixed race boy, um, Asian, white. But other than that, that was it. I wasn't at, wow. in an educational setting with another black female till I was 17. At six wow. Four. Yeah. And there was two of us, I think, three of us. Um, but thank goodness I met my boyfriend at 17, black Jamaican boyfriend. And wow, honestly, I laugh, but thank goodness, because I don't know. I, yeah, I'm not sure what how I would have got that cultural information. And what did that mean for you? What did getting, how did that getting that cultural information look? What, what did you do? What did you was, find out? Oh, God. Just, the food. I mean, his mum. What she throw down? <laughs> oh my god, she could. No one can cook curry goat rice and peas like that woman. That's like my ultimate favorite food. That's my death row last. Is that your death row last meal? Yeah, it is a yeah. solid choice. I have to say, I'm, I'm about it. <laughs> and her patty. So the food, the music. Did she made her own patties. Yeah. Oh, just amazing. Every, everything. So all of just that um being around his wider family mm. um language music history and I how did you feel because obviously you've been completely alienated from it did it feel like it was innate did it feel like you were coming home or did it feel like this is what was expected of you like how you know how, how did it feel there was a slight sense of coming home but a slight sense of I feel like a white person here because it was wow. so different, mm -hmm. so different. I don't have, and as I've got old, you know, I don't have the same um, points of reference to people. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting with a team years ago, a team I was in, um, and they were talking about like physical discipline growing up. They were all black workers sharing similar stories. I couldn't. I couldn't. And I think as I've got older, I am just kind of, I am what I am. I am literally a product of my upbringing and my oh, background. Yeah. I can't pretend to be anything else. Um, and so people have to take me as I am. But yeah, thank goodness I met him at 17 um, and his family, because that probably was, it feels like an education, but it was an education for me. And I think for me, it... The sadness is that all of that ethnic cultural, all the stuff you just, all the nuances of different cultures, you can never make that up, I don't think. You can't yeah. necessarily make that up, that lived experience. And it is, that, that was stolen from me. It feels like that was stolen from me. And that's something I can't, you know, I've got black friends, you know, you cannot make that up. Um, so there's a huge weight of sadness as well. What did it look like for you as, were you sort of, Ava always talked about how rapacious she was once she got around black people. She was like, I just needed it all. I want it all. The food, the culture, the guys, everything. You know, um, she, she, was a, she was a glutton for it. And um, my experience is slightly different, but uh, yeah. How did you I, feel? Was it, were you as rapacious? I, I was, no, God, I wish I had been. I was much more, I think I've always been an observer anyway, mm -hmm. and I think that's to do with my background being hypervigilant and observing and watchful. Yeah. So I think it was more about um, once doing it more subtly than ever, to be honest. But um, 
God, I remember going to black hairdressers and feeling terrified because I just thought people can see I don't fit in. Yeah, I, I, I really empathise with that. I was brought up in a very white well, area. I mean, I have black family, so I spent time with yeah. them. And I don't feel, you know, but I don't or didn't speak the way that I was supposed to. Or I don't know, yeah. you know, but there are many things levelled. I'm sure you've, and I know Ava certainly has as well, that things levelled at me that, that I wasn't black enough or, yes. you know, yeah. and I'm not sure who, by whose standards, this arbitrary, yeah. <laughs> you know, arbitrary um, measure of blackness is. I know. I used to get all the time. Mm. Um, you don't sound black. You don't talk. Yeah. And so, okay. Show me. Tell me what I'm supposed to talk to. How I'm supposed to talk. Yeah. People would and say, okay, my empty. name. Yeah. My yeah. name. People will say, that's not a black name. Yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? I was, I'm always amazed or astounded at how limiting people's idea of yeah. blackness is. It, it's such a two-dimensional, tiny sliver in which totally. we're allowed to um, exist. Uh, yeah. We're not allowed multi, to be multifaceted. No. We're not allowed, we have to like all the black things and we're not allowed to, to, to veer from that. It's completely, that's just not black. Um, and I find that really strange. And I think... We suffer for it, actually. Totally. And I think for me in my life, there's always been these two positions. You're not black enough. I think with the prosecution, mm. oh, I'm not, I think there's an issue about me not coming across as a victim, as in I'm weeping and can't string a sentence together sometimes. And also you've been so out. proactive, which isn't what yeah. victims do. So people don't, I think people don't know what to really make of me. Also, mm. I am rape conceived and I think I'm used to talking about it. I'm open about it, but I'm very struck by I think this is a topic that's still very much taboo within the arena of violence against women and girls. It's very confronting to say to someone, think of a 13 year old, think of a 13 year old girl, you know, and if she was raped and was pregnant, people don't want to go there. Of course you wouldn't want to go there. And then also the child that you came came from that situation, you came from that situation. And people don't even see that. Yeah. And, you know, in the media, in film and in books, there's such a lazy trope of also being adopted and rape conceived. It's like, oh, you're a wrong and you're a bad mm. seed. You're going to be this mentalist in whatever kind of film it is. I think the only positive has been Olivia Benson in Special Victims <laughs> Unit as kind of as a rape conceived person who's not depicted as an absolute crackpot or a risk mm-hmm. to people. So I think I present... I'm very multifaceted and I think that can be difficult for people. And how do you, what, how have you learned to live with all of this? I, I need to, we need to get different words for resilience and tenacity because I'm sick of saying it myself, (laughs) but I have resilience and tenacity and I'm not sure I would love to do genealogy because I think there's a kick-ass woman in my background who was part of the slave rebellion. I really do. I think there was somebody who, yeah, um, I'm not sure. I should almost not be functioning as I have been. But I don't know. There's something in me that I think this sense of injustice has got me through. I've got a very dark, twisted sense of humour and dark, twisted sense of humour. Friends, humour gets me through. yeah, I think. And do you think it helps you with your line of work? As you said, you're a social worker. I am a social worker, and mm. that's brought complexities. I've worked in adoption. I've worked with child sexual exploitation. I've worked wow. in triggering. Is that um, triggering? Sorry, even if that's a blunt question, but I mean that must. It, it's hard for somebody who hasn't got that the history that you do. Surely, that is there. You know, how is that? Does that is it, does it make you feel I, better, or does it? Is it both things at once? I feel like I'm able, to, I've been able to separate my job and work to stay. I'm not going home referring, think, you know, thinking about my own stuff. Mm. I think I can use my own experience and knowledge appropriately. Um, it's helped that, that insight I have around pain, loss, separation around adoption. Um, you know, I haven't told people I'm adopted, that I work, you know, clients and things, but um I think it has helped. I think the triggering aspect is seeing systems not change. There's times I've said to people, 
I'm 40 plus years and there's I'm still seeing the stuff going up same things happening and this my case is a perfect example lack of accountability there's still children in Birmingham I'm sure and elsewhere millions not being listened to not being protected there's evidence but no one's going after them um so I think that's been the most difficult aspect of my job is seeing these repeated mistakes um the poor treatment poor safeguarding poor care of people really vulnerable people yeah that I can understand that must that is the hardest thing and actually often yeah. on the show, at the end of the show we ask whatever our guest is what's gonna you know what what do you think has changed and then everyone just says nothing actually it's worse and then I make calls for some kind yeah. of um, extreme ways of dealing with it that we have to edit the show afterwards. So I'm not <laughs> going to do that now because I am capable of living and also learning. Um, but <laughs> now that's, I'm, I'm not in reality. Um, but yeah, I think that um, that's probably one of the, must be one of the hardest things. I mean, I think it's honestly, I am so in awe, not only that you come out of this fighting, 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 fighting and not stopping, but also that you've Fighting, 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 and you now you do like one of the heroes' jobs. You do the heroes' job, you know. There are like five heroes' jobs. The rest of them are just crap <laughs> jobs that we do just to get paid and live. But social work is one of the hero jobs, and like just fighting on another front continuously. So, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, especially the job I do now, I work with women who've had children removed. So yeah, that's close to home. That is um, close to home. Yeah, yeah. But I just think it's it's an absolute privilege to work with them. These are women who are so marginalised. Again, histories of child sexual abuse, domestic abuse, um, being traumatised by a system. Um, and it's an honour, really, because I've learned so much. I used to always say, I'm down with the birth parents. I, you know, yeah, all right, but you've got a lot to learn. And I have. I've learned so much from them. It's an absolute privilege that people... And I guess from my experience of feeling traumatised by a system in doing this prosecution, it's an absolute privilege that the women I've worked with would trust. I think that really, really has dawned on me. Yeah. Someone from Birmingham Council wanted to come and work with me as an adopted adult. I couldn't do it. But the women I work with, they're saying, OK, we know you're connected to this organisation. But, but I think we'll as well, work with you. imagine the amount, I mean, I can only imagine rather the amount of insight that you can give a mother who's had her children removed. Like that's, I mean, there's, there's, that's quite like limitless, isn't it? Really, you couldn't, you could never get that from somebody who had potentially hadn't been through what you've been through. Yeah, I mean, see, I don't go into my story with them. No, I don't mean, but I mean, just for my of, own, yeah, yes, just in experience. terms of. And suggesting you don't need to go I assume you can't you never go into detail would you know no. but I just mean in terms of just guiding things or suggesting things or you yeah know, empathizing with potentially what their child might be feeling or absolutely absolutely yeah. and with adoption work as well being able to yes. do that work with yeah. you know, have you thought about your child at this age this age um yeah oh gosh Daisy you are fantastic 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 uh, woman. Oh, thank you. But no, thank it's you. An absolute inspiration. Um, take take that as it's meant. Um, is there any charity or organisation that you would suggest that anybody who's in your situation, or potentially was a mother who's had had ch children removed, or was an adoptee, that you would suggest they spoke to before we wrap things up? Um, there's a, oh, that's a lot of people, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yes, it is. Well, you cover a lot of bases in your heroism. I do. Um, you do. Your money's worth with me. You really you do. You take very much value um, for money, Daisy. <laughs> I don't know where we're going with that, but and there's that dark know. sense of humour, I assume, somehow, yeah. Um, right. If I start with people conceived in rape, because that's my focus at the moment, it's not mm -hmm. spoken about. Um, so, obviously, my issue has been there isn't any enough spe specific services. Um, mm. There is one... A charity called Mokra, M O C R A, mm -hmm. and that's been founded by Dr. Jess Taylor. I don't have lots of information, but I know they've got a helpline. Okay, um, we'll, put it, we'll look them up and pop the links under them. Yeah. So, so if you just give us the names, it saves you having to try and remember yep. their websites and things. Yeah, not that good. Not that good. <laughs> don't worry um, about it. 
for adoptees and um, also for anybody who's had experience of rape, sexual assault, mm -hmm. rape crisis, um, every where there are independent organisations as well in people's local boroughs, local authorities. Um, for adoption, I would say um, it's really important for people to get an adoptee, an adopted competent therapist, somebody who really does understand adoption. It's so complex, it really is. Um, I would recommend anybody impacted by adoption or long-term fostering or special guardianship they also deal with, uh, work with. Uh, mm. That's PAC UK and they're based in London. Um, they've got offices in Leeds, but have a national helpline um, that people can contact. Who else will be saying? Um, we had a list, concern. didn't we? <laughs> we started off with Mokra um, and then we had rape crisis and then it was adoptees. And I, yeah, and I mean, I guess, is there, I, do they cover transracial adoption as well? Yes, they do. Yeah. They do as well. Um, and yeah just because adoption but transracial adoption just a whole other layer of complexity as well but they they do really good work um and there's also a brilliant podcast it's an american podcast called adoptees on mm -hmm. um and that's brilliant and i would also say for adult adoptees adoptees futures they're doing really good work for adult adoptees as well Great. So we'll put those links in underneath because I think often with this kind of stuff, people don't know where to start. Yeah. Right? So they don't know where to start. And even if they have started in terms of seeking help with therapy or looking up their birth parents, that's not that's just the beginning, I, I assume. Yeah. I guess from my experience of people that I know and I'm related to that have been through this process, is this the beginning? That's kind of like that's yeah. like just looking at it in the first, and then you have to deal with everything like that you've not dealt with up until this yeah day. just making those first steps just making that decision to get your files for example mm. I think people are worried they're going to find out information like I found out or the yeah. birth parent is dead or they'll be rejected so that yeah so important to have really good support right along yeah. the way oh god you've been a superb guest Daisy I'm we're so grateful to have had you um we will put this online and um yeah thank you so much so so much to stay on a little bit after yeah. if you don't mind after I stop recording all right thanks guys it's been really great to have Daisy on hopefully if you do need uh, any more information you can have a look at the links that will be underneath uh, the YouTube video or the Spotify video uh, hopefully we'll have Ava back next time I'm not sure what the topic will be but you'll find it on our Twitter Black and Women's Hour or our Instagram. Thanks. Bye.